Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Monmouth County. My name is Vanessa Mayerhe, and I'm here representing the Social Justice Committee. This committee is really more like a coalition, since we are active in so many areas. To name just a few, climate action, racial justice, reproductive justice, rainbow coalition, and strengthening our democracy. We meet by Zoom at 7 p.m. on the second Monday of the month, and all are welcome. And whoever you are, whomever you love, however you arrived at this beloved place today, you are welcome here. Our mission is to create community, transform ourselves, and transform the world. I draw your attention to the back side of your orders of service for announcements and service information for next week. After the service, those gathered in person are welcome to visit with one another. Coffee will be served in the community room and people of all ages are welcome. If you are new to us, please do visit our website, uucmc.org, where you can sign up to get all the latest news of the congregation by email. We look forward to getting to know you better. Please put your devices on silent as we enter into worship together and welcome again to this place of love and hope. Good morning. Betty Jackson King, born in 1928, was a pianist, singer, educator, choral conductor, and composer. And the piece that I'll play for you today is dedicated to Dr. Geneva Handy Southall, a pianist and black music researcher who was King's friend and colleague. King began teaching music at Wildwood High School in New Jersey in 1969. Her presence there desegregated the staff for the first time, and she passed away right here in New Jersey in 1994.
I'm the Reverend Dr. Craig Rubano, and we are so glad you've chosen to be with us here in the Earth Room, on the live stream, or whenever you are watching via our YouTube library. Our theme for the month of March has been vulnerability. And two weeks ago, in the context of Women's History Month, we looked at the vulnerability of reproductive rights in this country. Today we focus on history itself, on the way the stories of some people's lives are vulnerable to being forgotten, given that history until recently has centered on the accomplishments of men. To set the scene, you will see our walls decorated by Sister Circle, a group of women that has been meeting for 29 years to honor an earth-centered spirituality while creating community. This installation features artworks from the collections of Rebecca Scarborough and Linda Stalick, a perfect setting for a very special Sunday in the life of this community as we welcome the annual Endowed Myra Zinke Lecture. Dr. Myra Zinke, a Holmdel internist and psychiatrist and a congregant of UUCMC, recognized very early how cultural issues impinge on women's physical and mental health. And she brought an ethical vision of inclusion to her work. She was also a chipper away at the glass ceiling in her field, becoming the first woman president of the State Medical Society. At her death in 2010, she left a bequest to fund an annual speaker on women's issues and to promote gender equality. And we are honored to have with us as the 2023 Dr. Myra Zinke Lecturer, Professor of History, Jane Semeca who teaches at Brookdale Community College. She earned a master's degree in history and a graduate certificate in women's studies from Rutgers University. Professor Semeca is a master teacher and loves working with students in a variety of courses, including women's history, world civilization, and New Jersey history. Her mission in coming to Brookdale was to create a woman-centric curriculum pushing to have women's history coursework count academically as American history coursework. This morning she shares with us a history she herself has uncovered, soon to be published in the form of the first biography of Geraldine Livingston Morgan Thompson, a woman whose name graces many a sign in Monmouth County and whose influence extended far beyond its borders, yet whose profession, at least in the census, was always none. The book, Mrs. Thompson Saves the Day, the current title anyway, will open up Thompson's life as an example of the history that goes unwritten. That is, until someone takes up the challenge and assumes the risk of telling the story. When previously untold lives are revealed, New worlds are opened, and their story's telling allows hope to linger in all our hearts, that the contours of our own lives are precious and worth hearing about. This is important work as well as risky work, for stories that adjust history as we had previously understood it are not always welcome at the table. A very heartfelt UUCMC, welcome to Professor Jane Semeca. Thank you for being here, Jane. Our call to worship, with worship defined as a shaping concern for all that is of worth, addresses the risk in telling one's story. Colorado-based poet Laura Hershey's telling what you risk telling your story, you will bore them, your voice will break, your ink spill and stain your coat, 
No one will understand. Their eyes become fences. You will park yourself forever on the outside, your differentness once and for all revealed, dangerous. The names you give to yourself will become epithets. Your happiness will be called bravery, denial. Your sadness will justify their pity. Your fear will magnify their fears. Everything you say will prove something about their God or their economic system. Your feelings that change every day, kaleidoscopic, will freeze in place, brand you forever, justify anything they decide to do with you. Those with power can afford to tell their story or not. Those without power risk everything to tell their story and must. Someone Somewhere will hear your story and decide to fight, to live, and refuse compromise. Someone else will tell her own story, risking everything. Come, let us worship together. We place a flame in a chalice to symbolize the sacred space created every time we gather and to be reminded that each of our inner sparks needs ongoing rekindling. Linda Stalick will light our chalice this morning. Our chalice lighting words come from self-described black lesbian mother warrior poet Audre Lorde, one of my favorites, who fought against categories that would contribute to marginalization, working in to define herself as her self. She writes, I was going to die sooner or later, whether or not I had even spoken myself. My silences had not protected me. Your silences will not protect you. What are the words you do not yet have? What are the tyrannies you swallow day by day and attempt to make your own until you will sicken and die of them still in silence. We have been socialized to respect fear more than our need for language. If I didn't find myself for myself, I would be crunched into other people's fantasies for me and eaten alive. It is not our differences that divide us. It is our inability to recognize, accept, and celebrate those differences. Thank you, Linda. A reimagining of the African American spiritual climbing Jacob's Ladder, our opening hymn was written in 1975 by Carol Etzler, in which rather than following a straight line up and up a ladder, we move in a circle. Seeking, finding, and naming our own history. The words will be on the slide. We are dancing Sarah's circle. Louise will play it through once for us. And we can rise as we are able and willing.
I was happy Craig said I could be boring. Um, so here it goes. Um, my name is Liz DeBeer, and I am part of the Ted Wardell, Liz DeBeer duo. Ted Wardell is um, visiting with my daughter because she isn't well and has a baby, can't pick up the baby. So she's heal while she's healing, we're I'm going to go up there right after. So don't don't feel too sorry. Um, <laughs> Anyway, so here's what happened. Um, I went to college, and so did Ted, and we met each other. And then, this actually is going to get somewhere, so hang on, guys. So I re-met Ted. We like liked each other, but big surprise, he thought I was a little too loud. Uh, I thought he was a little too quiet. But then we met again in New Jersey, and we liked liked each other, and um, we decided to get married. So we went to visit my rabbi up in Albany, New York, and he pointed out that our marriage was not going to work. Um, and I didn't recall asking him that, but, but uh, <laughs> he wanted to make sure my husband knew that, that no kidding around, my family was like Jewish, Jewish, and my father had been the president of the temple and I, Liz, had been the president of the youth group and he wasn't sure my husband was aware that this was certainly not gonna work out. <laughs> so I decided, this was a reform temple and I decided to reform right out of there. So, uh, <laughs> then we went church shopping in New Jersey, right? So. You'd be surprised. Sometime when we have a lot more time, I'll tell you about what we discovered at the various churches we went to. But then we came here, and um, as my husband said, he realized all along he had been a UU. And um, Howard Dean was there. Eventually, we signed the book, and Howard Dean was, um, I believe, the founding minister. And, and we signed the book with Howard Dean, which was a tremendous honor. And um, then along came Kathleen, Evan, Virginia, Craig. We had a lot of great ministers. And I said to, I think it was Reverend Virginia, but Ted's not here to correct me, so I'll go with that. I said, um, I sometimes feel confused. And she said, confusion is a holy place to be. And I was like, OK, now I'm feeling it here, <laughs> right? <laughs> So as we grew with the congregation um, and volunteered, which is key, uh, we started to grow with the congregation and became closer to a lot of the people here. And uh, we found this was a place both to celebrate and a place to mourn. And we've been here for beautiful ceremonies, celebrating people's births. And of course, sometimes people who we cherished, we've celebrated their deaths and 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 yet here we do this together and um, the mission statement says here this is the place that we create community and transform ourselves and transform the world and certainly certainly you don't need to be at UUCMC to do those things but I'll tell you it's a lot more fun doing it together thank you
Good morning. Here at UUCMC, and as Unitarian Universalists, it's a little, is that loud? Sorry, it sounds very loud. Uh, here at UUCMC and as Unitarian Universalists, we know how important equality is. We know that all genders are whole and holy, but the world hasn't always seen it that way. And so in honor of Women's History Month, I offer you a story about a woman who persisted time and time again, when people expected different things of her because of her gender. I want to also acknowledge that today's story is about someone that most of you in this room probably know something about. But there are so many untold stories about women who have done amazing things in the world whose stories don't get shared. I chose this one because not only does it highlight Hillary Rodden Clinton, it also shows us why some of those stories have gone untold. In the 1950s, it was a man's world. Only boys could grow up to have powerful jobs. Only boys had no ceilings on their dreams. Girls weren't supposed to act smart, tough, or ambitious, even though deep inside they felt that way. But in the town of Park Ridge, Illinois, along came Hillary. Wearing thick glasses and a sailor's dress, acing tests, upstaging the boys in her class, and lining up sports events to raise money for the poor. Take that, 1950s. Some girls are born to lead, and some love politics and public service. Through her church, Hillary learned about the troubled world beyond the green lawns and tree-lined streets of her town. Her youth group met with poor black and Latino teenagers in the inner city. They went to hear a stirring speech by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And Hillary's youth minister and her mother taught her to do the most good she can in the world. Hillary's hard work got her into a prestigious East Coast Women's College. The girls there at the school were smart. Hillary was elected president of the student body and was chosen to give the first senior graduation speech the school had ever had. At the ceremony, a senator discouraged students from protesting about America's problems. When it was her turn to speak, she did a startling thing. She criticized him. Her classmates applauded for seven thunderous minutes. After college, she went to law school. Most future lawyers were men. She won debates, attended rallies, and helped start a newspaper about how laws could improve society. That year, the college erupted with violent demonstrations over civil rights and the war in Vietnam. And when the angry students and professors met to discuss the strike, it was young Hillary that calmed everyone down. On summer break, Hillary investigated the poor conditions at camps for migrant workers in Florida, where kids couldn't go and get medical attention or go to school. She registered voters in Texas for a presidential campaign. Her friends thought Hillary would land a high-ranking job in Washington, D.C., but she didn't. Not yet. Instead, she went to Arkansas to be with Bill, her high school sweetheart. They decided to spend their lives together. Bill ran for office and got elected. Hillary helped with the campaign. She became a mother, 
worked at a law firm, and advised groups dedicated to children of the poor. She was a new breed, a superwoman, but sometimes it was hard. Like when she had to rush out of the courtroom to call the babysitter about her sick child. And when people said mean things about her and her looks, she didn't take when people said mean things about her and her looks because she didn't take time to paint her toenails or style her hair. She helped Bill become president of the United States, but she couldn't believe how people criticized her in ways that they would never criticize a man. They said that her headbands were too casual, her attitude too feisty. An ex-president said that a first lady shouldn't be too strong or too smart. Others called her the Hillary problem and a lot worse things than that. After Bill became president, Hillary led a task force on health care so that all Americans could afford to see a doctor. Some people hated her and her new ideas. She was tough as nails, news stories said. Congress turned down her health plan, and she thought about Eleanor Roosevelt, another president's wife who tried to help the needy. People told Eleanor to go back to knitting. Hillary got back to work and became a goodwill ambassador overseas. In villages, she heard heartbreaking stories about how baby girls were abandoned. She couldn't stay silent. And at a United Nations conference, she said what no other world leader was willing to say. Women's rights are human rights, once and for all. At the end of Bill's term, she finally got a chance to run for office and became a U.S. Senator from New York. No First Lady had ever done such a thing. After taking office, she fought hard to help the firefighters and first responders who got sick after the attack on September 11th. She wanted to serve her country. In 2007, at age 55, she joined the race to become a candidate for president. Reporters and opponents made fun of her for her age, her laugh, her legs, her ambition. She knew they would. But she kept fighting. She thought it was not enough to win. She earned a record-breaking 18 million votes. And during her concession speech, Hillary said that those 18 million votes were 18 million cracks in the glass ceiling, the hard, invisible prejudice that prevents women from becoming powerful leaders. President Obama wanted her to be his Secretary of State. The, women, the woman called too ambitious now met with kings, sultans, and prime ministers. Wherever she went, her message was the same. The role and rights of women, their freedom and equality and dignity is the unfinished business of the 21st century. No one, no one gets to stop a girl from being the greatest that she can be. Hillary thinks that everyone deserves a chance. And all her life, she fought for fairness and compassion. The cruel words, the unfair barriers were not enough to hold her back. And so I say to you, my friends, follow your dreams and your passions and don't ever doubt the positive impact that you can make on the world. May it be so.
and youth will go to their classes with Go Now in Peace. Every week in this congregation, we are provided with an opportunity to practice generosity. This is your invitation to contribute to the well-being of our congregation and to our area neighbors through the good works of local organizations, which receive half of the monies collected each month. Our Share the Plate recipient for March is Planned Parenthood of Northern, Central, and Southern New Jersey. Our closest clinic is in Shrewsbury, which receives our donations. Planned Parenthood offers a variety of many service of, sorry, Planned Parenthood offers a great many services, including abortion, free STD, COVID, HIV, and pregnancy testing, emergency contraception and birth control, as well as pregnancy options counseling and cancer screening. Its budget has been severely diminished in recent years. Therefore, our financial support is greatly appreciated. For those of you present here in the meeting house, the plates will be passed by the ushers. You may also join in this time of generosity via text, send your offering by mail, or charge your contribution online with a memo designating an amount to Planned Parenthood. Please give generously. I now welcome to our pulpit the 2023 Dr. Myra Zinke Lecturer, Professor Jane Semeca. Thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this service today. Oh, I just feel so wonderful being up here. <laughs> I'm enjoying this ceremony so much I, I almost forgot I had to actually speak. <laughs> It's such an honor to be this year's Myra Zinke lecturer. When Dr. Uh, Reverend Rubano contacted me, he explained that Dr. Zinke's bequest was made to support gender issues and that this month the congregation's theme was vulnerability. I was excited to join you because Mrs. Thompson's story satisfies both of these themes perfectly. In fact, I cannot think of anyone who is a stronger example than Geraldine Thompson. She worked for over 50 years to help people. I teach women's history at Brookdale Community College. But over the last two years, I began a research project on Geraldine Livingston Thompson when I realized that she had been forgotten. All this woman has done to create policies and organizations to help the poor, the sick, incarcerated people, the elderly, and children. Yet no biography has ever been written on Mrs. Thompson. She has been overlooked and forgotten by historians. 
The slide projected on the screen is my table at the New Jersey State Archives in Trenton. My research journey has been difficult. Women rarely have their papers saved. While men's papers are safely ensconced in libraries and archives, often the evidence of women's lives land in a dumpster. Even prominent women like Geraldine Thompson, this is a gender lesson in and of itself. The bias of historians, the message that women's lives are not worth writing about or remembering. So I had to find her. I had to find her letters in other ways. Often I would go to a library or an archive and ask for Geraldine Thompson and I would often be told, oh, we don't have anything on her here. And I learned to respond, she's here, I know she's here, because that man whose papers you have, she worked with him on this committee or in this organization, so I know she wrote him letters, I know she's in there. And so I spent many days in that chair, reading box after box, like Robert Caro has advised us to turn every page. Every page I turned and eventually that, that Brookdale Farm stationery would appear and her signature at the bottom of the page. And I can't tell you how absolutely exciting that is when you unearth the person and their work right before you. So the biography, as Reverend Rubano said, the working title is Mrs. Thompson Saves the Day. And hopefully the result of this book, which isn't finished yet, uh, but I'm still on my journey. And on this slide, you see a picture of Geraldine Thompson and her husband, Louis S. Thompson, in the Adirondacks when they were a young couple about around turn of the century. She was born in 1872, and she died in 1967. So she had a long life, 95 year long life. And I wanted to spend a moment talking a little bit about why I chose Mrs. Thompson Saves the Day as the title for the project. I chose the title Mrs. Thompson Saves the Day after reading an article that I had found in the Daily Record, which was a small newspaper in Long Branch the article that I read was published in July of 1912, so she was 40 years old at this point. And that's another interesting part of women's history, is that as a young woman, she really was not working in the community until, you know, after her children were grown and things. So at the age of about 40, she becomes extremely active. In this article, that's titled, Raise Money for Auto Truck in Day. The firehouse in Red Bank, called the West Side Hose Company, was going to have their fire truck repossessed. And the firemen were in a panic that they were going to lose their fire truck. And so they went to Brookdale Farm and they asked Mrs. Thompson for help. And the reporter wrote, later in the article, and it's highlighted there on the slide, that Mrs. Lewis S. Thompson of Brookdale Farm saved the day for the West Siders. I thought, that's it. Mrs. Thompson saves the day for everyone. She loved helping people. And so whether it was the, uh, the firehouse in Red Bank or any of her neighbors or the state of New Jersey, she was there to help. I became really interested in why. What made her a generous, caring, compassionate person? I wanted to understand her. I wanted to understand what made her her. And I feel that a few things really shaped her personality and her commitment to people. The first thing was her grandmother. She's named for her grandmother. Geraldine Livingston Hoyt was her grandmother, and she lived with her grandmother. They all lived in Washington Square uh, in New York City. And 
her grandmother was a member of an organization called the State Charity Aid Association of New York. And every Wednesday, her grandmother would leave the house and walk outside to a horse and carriage that was waiting for her that would take her to the river where she would get in a boat and be rowed across the river to Blackwell's Island. And in New York City at the end of the 19th century, Blackwell's Island housed all the institutions, the prisons, the mental hospitals, uh, the poor house, all those institutions were housed at Blackwell's Island. So Geraldine Hoyt would go every Wednesday with her notebook and a pencil, and she would inspect the conditions at the institutions. And so one week she would go and do one institution, and then the next week she would make her rounds around the entire island. Later in the day, she would return to the house, and she would have lunch and sit and tell her granddaughters about what she saw. These reports that she took down in her notebook would then go to Albany with other women to lobby the state, to pressure them, and to address the problems and the improve the conditions of those housed on Blackwell's Island. When Geraldine Thompson grew up, she did the same thing, only she drove around in a Lincoln Continental, not a horse and carriage, and she would get in her car and she'd drive all over the state of New Jersey and to inspect the women's reformatory in Clinton, the home for boys in Jamesburg, the home in Vineland for uh, the developmentally disabled, and she would also travel all around the state of New Jersey and examine conditions and then go to Trenton and fight. And she, would, she was famous for marching into the governor's office without an appointment and would walk past the state trooper guarding the door and walk in and tell the governor what needed to be done. She also did this with state uh, officials. And as I sat in my chair in the New Jersey State Archives, I would find letters from her to state officials that often began with, I'm sorry I missed you at your office today. <laughs> so she was uh, renowned for you know, without an appointment, just appearing and letting them know. Or letters I also found that said, I will be in the state capitol tomorrow. I would really love just a few minutes of your time. So she was followed in her grandmother's tradition of helping the people who were the most vulnerable, who couldn't fight for themselves the people who were incarcerated, uh, children and adolescents who were in juvenile detention, things of that nature concerned her because somebody had to fight for them. They couldn't fight for themselves. And another thing that really shaped her was her education. Women of her social class, because she was a, an elite prominent family, were educated at home. And uh, in the previous uh, presentation, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt was uh, mentioned. And Eleanor Roosevelt also was tutored at home and was Geraldine Thompson's very good friend. Uh, in addition to being tutored at home, she did have two years of convent school in France. And I wanted to speak to a, for a second about her education. The, School she attended in France is the School of the Sacred Heart, the Sacre Coeur, in Tours, France. And the mission of the Sacred Heart School was shaped by a nun named Madeleine Sophie Barat, who had, because of the French Revolution, decided that a school was necessary to educate women. Now remember, in the 1800s, women's education was not a popular idea. So Madeleine Sophie Barat proposed that in order to fix society's 
problems, to return society to a moral footing, women were necessary. That by educating women who were virtuous and helpful, that social change and returning morality to society was possible. Geraldine Thompson's parents sent her and her sisters to the Sacred Heart School for two years in France, and they certainly learned that lesson of being virtuous, moral, and helpful women because they did that in their entire lives, working for positive social change. Another thing I've learned in my research journey is that by reading, I've read hundreds of her letters at this point. She closed every letter, whether she was writing to a friend or to a government official, with a personalized closing, blessings to you. And she, I've seen her write this over and over again. And this tells the historian that this is important. It's an important message that she's leaving on every single piece of correspondence. And I really felt I needed to understand her and her faith. What role did her faith play in her life? She was raised in New York City. Her parents and her family attended Grace Church. And her, the reverend that she grew up uh, listening to at services was a Reverend Huntington, who also urged his congregation to work in their communities, to help the poor, to help the people in their neighborhoods. When she got married to Lewis Thompson in 1896, Reverend Huntington came to Dutchess County to perform her wedding ceremony. So he was a really important part of her life. She was also influenced by the social gospel. And during the Industrial Revolution and in the late 19th century in New York, the rise of immigration, the, the uh, increase in the populations in the cities were creating a lot of problems and a lot of things that needed to be addressed. She became a very good friend and a uh, follower of Reverend Harry Emerson Fostick. And he preached that helping the poor and the vulnerable was a very important part of Christian salvation that being a Christian was not just trying to save the world from sin, but to save the world. And Christianity was really important for solving the problems of inequality and to put social justice into place and to resolve the problems of poverty. And so while Mrs. Thompson, she taught Sunday school, as well here at the All Saints Church in Navasink. She attended a church here, Christ Church in Shrewsbury. She really lived the social gospel and believed deeply that saving the community was part of the most important thing in her life. She began her career in about 1910. She was recruited to the State Charity Aid Society in New Jersey. She became a member. And she began her career here in Monmouth County as a result of investigating the numbers of people who were suffering with tuberculosis. Tuberculosis had a, a terrible rebound in the United States in the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, killing thousands and thousands of people. She herself had tuberculosis and her husband, but they both had recovered. She began her career after investigating the numbers of people in the county because there were no services. There were no hospitals. There was really nowhere for people in Monmouth County to go for treatment. She lobbied the state to help change the laws, requiring the county governments to provide health care for the people in the county that needed uh, treatment for tuberculosis. And so in the spring of 1912, she attended a county government, what was then called the Freeholders, meeting 
And she went in order to advocate for the county to provide funding to help a 12-year-old African-American young man named Arkansas Bass who had lived in Long Branch. Arkansas Bass uh, was a, from a, uh, a low-income family, a disadvantaged family. He had tuberculosis, and because he was African-American, he was not admitted to the hospitals here in Monmouth County. There was very little opportunity for African-Americans to receive health care. His tuberculosis had reached an advanced stage, and he was at a healthcare facility in Long Branch that cared mostly for African American uh, maternity cases. And there he had had uh, his arm amputated. Um, but because there was no care for tuberculosis patients in Monmouth County, he was going to be returned to his home. And Mrs. Thompson told the freeholders that if Arkansas Bass was returned to his home, it was likely that tuberculosis was going to spread to his other members of his family. So she begged the uh, county officials to pay for him to go to a tuberculosis sanatorium in Trenton. In this article on the slide, it says that a couple of weeks later, after that meeting, the county government agreed to send Arkansas Bass to a hospital in Trenton for care through the efforts of Mrs. Lewis S. Thompson. And after I learned this story, I became curious as to what happened to Arkansas Bass and what happened to his family. I found him on the census, and you've got to forgive me for this terrible slide, but it's really sort of like that show, Finding Your Roots, where you look at the census in order to trace people's family history. I found Arkansas Bass in the census three years later. New Jersey did a 1915 census. The federal census is every 10 years, but New Jersey had done one on the fives. And Arkansas Bass was listed. And I was so happy to see he lived three more years from that county government meeting in 1912. He lived three more years. He was still at the hospital in Trenton. And I checked in 1920, and in 1920, he was no longer in the census. So by 1920, he had passed away. But his mother and his sister, Ella, and his brother, Oscar, were still alive and listed in Long Branch. So when you put all these pieces of the puzzle together, what I could understand was that Mrs. Thompson saved them. She provided the palliative care that Arkansas Bass needed, and she saved the rest of that Bass family from being afflicted with tuberculosis as well. Mrs. Thompson saves the day. After her advocacy for Arkansas Bass, a couple of weeks later, Mrs. Thompson started a Monmouth County public health organization known as the Visiting Nurse Association and Health Group today. It's 110 years old, and this organization is still serving over 60,000 families a year. She had the first meeting of the Visiting Nurse Association at her home at Brookdale Farm. And on this slide, I have this picture of her standing on her porch because I always think of her standing there waiting. Is anybody going to show up for this, you know? I put, the, I put the press release in the paper. Is anybody going to come to this meeting? 
She had announced that the first meeting was going to be held in July 1912 at Brookdale Farm. She welcomed anybody who wanted to attend. She really believed in getting people in the community engaged, engaged in politics, engaged in community efforts. And 150 people came to that first meeting. From every town in the county, somebody represented at this meeting. She also offered, if you were coming from the train station, she would send a car for you. Just let me know, and I'll send the car to pick you up at the Red Bank train station. The budget of this uh, first year was $3,000, was the budget for the first year of the Visiting Nurse Association. She and her husband gave 1000 of those 3,000. So in addition to being the leader and coordinating the Visiting Nurse Association, she also generously gave one-third of the annual budget. Here is her house at Brookdale Farm. You'll recognize it if you've gone to Thompson Park. And her home became her headquarters. She was a volunteer, and she understood that she could, because of her house, she could host hundreds and hundreds of meetings, events, and fundraisers. She always opened her home to the community. Some people have told me in the course of my research that when they were Boy Scouts, that the Boy Scouts would be invited to camp um, on the grounds at Brookdale Farm in the 60s if uh, they needed a place to have a camp. So the Visiting Nurse Association Health Group today, this is their current logo, still provides a variety of services. The organization that she started 110 years ago was always nimble, flexible, and responsive to what the community needed at that moment. In 1912, it was tuberculosis. It was public health and visiting nurses to go to people's homes to help them. And today they are, and then throughout the years, it has helped people during the Depression, helped people with all different kinds of health emergencies. And today we know that it responded during COVID to help people provide hospice care for people at the ends of their life, help the elderly, provide support services for LGBTQ um, members of the community as well. And I wanted to add this in as well about Mrs. Thompson. Mrs. Thompson was a prominent person, but she was also a woman who had a 40-year relationship with a woman. So she was married to four, for 40 years to Lewis Thompson and had four children. But she also had a 40-year-long relationship with a woman named Miriam Van Waters. And so she herself is a part of a vulnerable and a marginalized group herself. And so her compassion and her story resonates in so many different ways. When she was in her 90s, she gave an interview and she was asked, what is the secret to having a long life? And she, was said, and she responded, keep fighting for at least one cause, preferably an unpopular one. <laughs> Mrs. Thompson fought for her entire life for the underdog. She wanted to help the most vulnerable, children, the elderly, the sick, people who could not advocate for themselves. And I think she did a pretty good job. Um, she was somebody that I think is so inspiring and her story remains so relevant in our community today. Thank you so much. I'm just going to add, I'm going to stay after and have coffee in the community room. So if anybody would like to ask me any questions or talk to me, I'm going to stay around. So 
I look forward to meeting you individually later on. I invite us into a time of prayer and meditation. Uh, these words, a prayer for Women's History Month by UCC minister, the Reverend Victoria Wick. Blessed are the generations of brave women who dared to hope. Blessed are the generations of faithful women who dared to resist. Blessed are the women who have been making our congregations what they are since the very beginning. Blessed are the martyrs, the missionaries, the mystics, the prophets, the poets, the preachers. Blessed are the church staff members and women's group who often do the invisible labor of making everything work. Blessed are the first women ever seen behind the pulpit or heard to preach who made us wonder, what if? Blessed are the ancestors who forged a way in the wilderness so that we wouldn't have to fight the same battles and clear the same paths they did. Blessed are the ancestors who prepared the ground before them so that we wouldn't have to plant our seeds of possibility in inhospitable soil. Blessed are all those who claim titles and platforms our foremothers only dreamed of. 
And two, blessed are those who don't yet believe they're capable of becoming. Blessed are the descendants that will come after us, who will carry on the work we have yet to begin. And blessed are the descendants we may never meet, who will create the worlds we haven't yet dared to imagine. Amen. We sing our closing hymn. In the spirit of Sister Circle, whose members did our set design this month, a hymn to the goddess, to the earth, to the mother of all. The words are on the slide. Louise will play it through once to acquaint us with the Irish melody. We may rise in body and spirit. As we conclude this celebration of Women's History Month, let us thank again Sister Circle for the gift of art, and let us one more time extend our appreciation to our 2023 Dr. Myra Zinke lecturer, Professor Jane Semeca. We hope this will not be the last we see of you, Jane. We seek to strengthen our ties to Brookdale, and we'd love to help you celebrate the release of the Thompson biography. Our closing words of benediction come to us from a native of New York State who ended up the Poet Laureate of Maryland, <laughs> Lucille Clifton. Clifton's work emphasizes endurance and strength through adversity, focusing particularly on African-American experience and women's lives. She writes, Won't you celebrate with me what I have shaped into a kind of life? I had no model, born in Babylon, both non-white and woman. What did I see to be except myself? I made it up here on this bridge between starshine and clay, my one hand holding tight my other hand. Come celebrate with me that every day something has tried to kill me and has failed. <laughs> Let us go in peace.
to bless the world. Thank you.